Hello everyone, I'm Maria Mateos. I'll be your host today for our Life Sciences in Focus webinar. We have a terrific group of guests who will introduce themselves in a moment. But uh, let's start with a couple of housekeeping items so everyone who is joining today know how to participate in this webinar. So there's a Q&A tab. Please use it to enter your questions for the panelists. We'll have time to address those in the last 10 minutes uh, of the hour. There's also a live chat panel. Feel free to connect with other attendees there and tell us where you are logging in from so we know. Um, and for those with accessibility needs, you can turn on Zoom automatic caption feature. That's usually helpful. And if you want to connect with any of the speakers today, please send me a message by LinkedIn or drop me an email afterwards and I will facilitate that connection. We are recording today's session, so panelists, please smile. Um, and you will receive a replay email in the next days. Um, we are going to start with a short presentation to frame the topic and then move on to the discussion. So let's dive in. Uh, you may know our panelists, but I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, Juana, would you like to start? Thank you, Maria. Uh, okay, my name is Juana. I'm physician, I'm medical doctor. Uh, I study a master in bioethics, also um, project uh, management. And I have experience around 16 years ago in uh, regulatory activities. I start my regulatory activities after uh, leave the medical practice in regulatory agency and now I'm working around 14 years in in CRO. So it, it's great to know that we have this opportunity to share our experience and learn each another. Thank you. Thank you, Juana. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I'm not sure if you mentioned, but Juana is based in Colombia, so she will be providing insights for that specific country. Um, Charles, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Charles Schmidt. I'm a pediatrician. Uh, I have a master and PhD degree in pediatric infectious disease, but I'm also a professor in at Santa Casa Medical School for uh, a post-graduation program in clinical research and medical affairs uh, since 2007. Uh, and I've been working in clinical research uh, in academia, in private sector, CROs and pharma for almost 35 years now. Thank you. Wow, that's impressive. Thank you, Charles. Um, Julian, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, well, I'm. It's also a pleasure for me to be invited to this webinar. Um, I'm Julian Ortasosa. I'm a senior regulatory specialist and site activation in worldwide clinical trials now. Um, almost working for Argentina. Um, I work in different CROs uh, previously, like. IQ, via seniors, uh, or labor, uh, well, PRA, other laboratories as Novartis. And, well, I will talk about Argentina regulatory process and all you need. <laughs> Thank you, Juli. It's a pleasure to have you here. And now no, our main guest, Sarah. Thank you so much. I have a bit of a cold, so if you sneeze, sneezing or something, don't don't be alarmed. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but I know that Dr. Charles and Dr. Juana are really wonderful people in their countries. And I also have been in the business about a little over 15 years now. Before that, I was in pharma and more on the marketing and sales side. And what we have found in our business, which we're a strategic CRO based out of Florida, is that there's such a need to reach the Latino population. I even have my Colombian uh, earrings on today. 
So I'm very excited to be here. We really appreciate this opportunity to talk about the whole landscape of Latin America and how important it is to diversity, which we know that just came out today from the FDA. And we'll talk about that later. Thank you so much. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to have you here. And we are all eager to hear what you have to say today. So if you can go ahead and share your screen presentation, okay. holding your hands. So we're just having, this is just an overview. We're going to talk about navigating the regulatory landscape. You know, as I said, our company is based in Florida, but we have several partners in all the countries in Latin America. And we wanted to give you all an overview of what that looks like in the region, because it is such an important topic and it's our neighbor to the United States. So really, I just want to do a very, very brief intro to Pharmacon Global. We accelerate enrollment, which is super important through our Rare DM Alliance to ensure the right candidates are going to the trials. We have a strategic medical consulting group to help with things like what we're talking about today, auditing and regulatory and CSRs, et cetera. And then we also do a lot of training both for doctors becoming um, principal investigators as well as referring doctors. So it's very exciting to be here. Our agenda basically is to give you a general overview of key LATAM countries and to summarize the regulatory structure for clinical research in the key, again, LATAM countries. There's a lot of LATAM countries, but we're just gonna focus on a few today and then talk a bit about the strategies in the navigation of that. So this is just an overview of the key LATAM countries. I mean, the data keeps changing, but it's probably more closer to 700 million people, but it's about 650 million people in this region. If you look at that, that's about almost three times, well, twice what the United States is. So it is our big neighbor next door. The three largest LATAM countries are Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia. They're making up 70% of the, of the population. And there is a huge diversity that's available in these countries, whether it's Afro-descendants, Afro whether it's Latinos, Asian immigrants, it's a very, very big. And so we, we're gonna talk a bit about that at the end of today, but you know, the demographics are changing and we're seeing a rapid development in the Latam region with the potential for growth, especially in this area, both economic and social. So that's just a general overview right there. And there, you know, I do want to recognize that there are some, a number of Central American countries as well. And there's other countries, but we will be focusing mostly on those main countries and Argentina, which, by the way, congratulations, your inflation is like phew, coming down with your new president. I just spoke to our consultant <laughs> there and he said it's going to be zero next month. So that's great news. This Fingers is crossed. Yeah, we hope that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is a perspective on diversity. We like to use this when talking to our farmers and biotech partners. And why? Because diversity is the big topic of today. And also what's interesting is to look at the percent of clinical trials. And you can see that in the U.S., it's, you know, the big player here. Chinese is coming, you know, fast and furious behind us. But look at like Colombia, 0.5% of the total. I mean, this is based on a little bit of older data. Look at Brazil, huge country, 214 million, and yet only 2.59%. And then look at Mexico. We know that in the US, the Mexican descent population represents 63% of the, of the Latino population. So it's really critical to, to recognize this and to see where the opportunities lie. <clears throat> and of course we have India, which is this giant, you know, this giant country behind us. But this gives you a perspective of why it's so important. And then just a comment, and some of our projects, and Charles and I have worked on projects before, in particular, Brazil and Colombia also represent that Afro-American, Afro-descent, which is so important to clinical trials. So that's just a global perspective. So the key focus in all areas in clinical trials is that all of these countries do follow GCP and ICH guidelines and compliance. There's modern facilities and well-trained professionals. You know, gone are the days of the sombrero drinking tequila. You know, there's a, there's a real mindset that everything is slow in Latin America. Yes, things are slower. We enjoy life better, right? But that's very much modern. There's, there's you know, it's very good trained professionals. And the key conditions that do reflect, for example, the U.S. and the European population are 
infectious diseases. We had a, the largest set of clinical trials for COVID happened there. And immune disease, which is a growing area. Oncology, which represents over, I think over 50% of all clinical trials. Cardiology and rare disease. And I like to make a statement about rare disease. We now know there's 10,000 identified rare disease. So, and they're not so rare. You know, when you get that diagnosis and you start digging deeper, we're finding that these rare diseases are really not so rare after all. So that's that overview. This is a very broad view and it's changing. I mean, it's like a live document, but I thought this was important for our audience because I just spoke to a, a potential client yesterday and they're like, what? Brazil, 90 days or less? I mean, this is a big deal. So I, I wanted to just show here that yes, regulatory timelines are a little longer than say the US, and Europe, but look at the enrollment. The enrollment is very good in these countries. And my personal opinion is that the doctor still is king. The doctor still has weight in the United States. I mean, in Latin America, excuse me. And I think that's very important. I know me personally, I'd rather get direction from a physician than just make my own decision. Ultimately, obviously it's your own decision. But you can see here that Argentina is very good. Brazil is very good. Colombia is very good. Mexico is probably the most delayed. And Central America is very good. So that gives you a reality of what's going on in the regulatory timeline space. So now let's move over to the key strategies in navigating the regulatory landscape. Obviously, our experts here will be adding to this. And this is just an overview. But I just wanted to give you some bullets. So let's talk with the biggest country in Latin America, which is Brazil. There is so much going on there. It's just unbelievable. And I'm happy to have Charles here to give, to fill us in. But the biggest thing is an early engagement. You know, the UNVISA is the, the FDA equivalent. There's now a new uh, ethics committee and you wanna have this early engagement through these pre-submission meetings. It's critically important. <clears throat> it's a little bit like the FDA, they do allow that. Obviously you wanna have a, co a comprehensive dossier preparation and do it according to guidelines. And there will be quality checks throughout the process. The main thing, and this is also a bit cultural, is to have that efficient com communication and clear communication. You know, there's really good channels with Anvisa to facilitate timely responses, to have those local representatives, whether they're local regulatory experts or their local uh, CROs makes a big difference. It really can. And then of course, staying on top of all that process and make sure that, that your staff is well-trained. Continuing with Brazil, they do electronic submissions. They have great data management systems. And as I said before, using your local consultants and partnering with local institutions can make a very big difference. Risk management is very important. Again, but all these countries file, follow ICH and GCP guidelines. That's really important to understand, creating a strategy that makes sense for that clinical trial with flexibility and adaptation. And then I know Charles will be spending a little more time with this, but this just passed and it's gonna be implemented in 90 days. I believe that Brazil has, has spent 10 years working very hard to update this, this law. But this is to streamline the process, reduce the bureaucratic obstacles, improve assessment, and 90, 90 days, you have to have it done. This used to be true on fast track before for vaccines and rare diseases, but now it's all trials. And again, Charles can elaborate on that, but that does really change the landscape for Brazil. Moving on to Mexico. Uh, Mexico also is needed to do some early engagement with regulatory. <clears throat> you want to engage with COFEPRIS, which is the FDA equivalent, and the local research ethics commission or the committees that are early in the planning process. COFEPRIS has improved their procedure to import health supplies, and they have a checklist in their website to help you follow the evaluation of your trial. They have a comprehensive dossier preparation. And again, regulatory expertise using those local consultants will really help navigate the complex environment. This is their uh, DigiPris, they call it. This is their new platform where you can access a lot of information and hopefully that will speed it up somewhat. Efficient communication is very, very important. 
training and capacity, making sure their local investigators have the training, which we 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 always you know say let's we have the great trained physicians. Being adaptive and being able to shift is really important based on feedback. Let's move to Argentina. This is something I just wanted to make a statement right, right here. Argentina is a very nimble country. And as I mentioned earlier, now they're not having inflationary problems. And they have been one of the best agencies to work with in Latin America. They were one of the first to get things moving. So again, Argentina has the population. They have super trained uh, physicians. And again, you want to leverage your local expertise who have that deep understanding of the regulatory landscape and use your, your partners to do so. Be prepared for regulatory inspections and have clear communication plans. I think I did not put in here the fact that you can also speak to Anvisa, and it, maybe it's in the next slide. No, it's Columbia. You can also speak to the Anvisa people in a pre-submission way. So I failed to put that in there and they do a great job with, excuse me, with Anmat, who is the local FDA equivalent for Argentina. Okay, I hope I'm not moving too quickly. How's our time? No, we're doing great. Okay, just checking time. Yes, yes, we're doing great with time, Zara. Thanks, thanks for checking. And then, and then some of the other LATAM countries, I know we have a representative here from Colombia, but Colombia has become, is a little more bureaucrat, bureaucratic versus the US. They have a great electronic system. One of the things that stands out in Colombia is that their sites have to be certified by NVIMA, the FDA equivalent, so that shows that their sites are extreme high, very high quality. They have to go through a process. They're open to, to be talking to the ethics. There is a pre-submission process. You don't want to submit the protocol in advance of that submission. And there's probably other things that one is going to, going to talk about. In Central America, local expertise is definitely needed to arrive to a faster pathway. But what's interesting here is it's much quicker. Local sites can actually do their own regulatory and their patients are there. So again, I encourage to think about Central America. They're very small countries, but some of them are really very super. Panama, Puerto Rico, are, are, uh, Ecuador, are, they've had some political problems overall, but they're really great. Peru is working to improve their regulatory quality, but again, they have a lot of the patients depending a lot on the diseases like infectious diseases, rare diseases, are definitely the patient population. <clears throat> those other LATAM countries. So that is me, and I'm gonna stop sharing now. And I just appreciate everybody being here. And now we're gonna dig a little deeper with Maria. Thank you, Maria. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. So many insights here, uh, compressed into 20 slides. And um, I guess we can speak for a couple of hours uh, easily about this. And I have a lot of questions already, uh, but uh, let me kick off this panel discussion with asking our panelists to respond to Sarah's presentation. I noticed among all of the countries you mentioned Colombia and since Juana is local in Colombia, I'm curious to hear what she has to say um, about the presentation and maybe add a couple of insights for our audience. For sure, thank you, Sarah. To to uh, present the, the general things in Colombia. And I would like to share with you that before the pandemic, we start, I, I mean, we, uh, the, the local authority, uh, start to use the um, submission through the platform. The platform is called Protocols Online for the first submission and then for subsequent submission, we have a virtual office. Uh, on the other hand, the communication, as Sara mentioned, it, uh, the communication with the health authority is open and allowed to us to have pre-submission meetings. And uh, this communication is good for us because uh, for those uh, protocols with uh, alternative or complex uh, design or maybe for advanced te technologies, uh, make make us easy the the work in regulatory activities. Additionally, of course, as as uh, as uh, Sara mentioned, uh, we have a robust legislation, and uh, also Sara uh, talk about the certification, and it's 
uh, conduct to high quality our pharmacies, uh, our site. So for instance, in, if some uh, study medication require uh, some handle or some adaptation for patient, uh, our site's pharmacies must be certified in good clinical manufacturing, in good manufacturing uh, uh, practices, sorry. And, and in this way, with a robust uh, quality uh, SOPs and process and everything, uh, maybe we could avoid cross-contamination between substance and the quality uh, the product delivered to the clinical research participant uh, thus avoiding some biases in the analysis of the results that we have. So this is the, the high quality results. And finally, uh, of course, we have a very nice location in the, in the world. So we have uh, two coasts, one in the Pacific, one in the Atlantic, in the North. So uh, we have uh, mountains. This vari variety of the weathers allow to have, to have high quality sites in different location with different population. And maybe we will have the opportunity to have uh, sites located in tropical uh, areas. And of course, the, the prevalence of these tropical diseases uh, such as dengue, chikungunya, malaria, is different that the population that we have concentrated in, hur in urban concentration and uh, the pathologies in the uh, urban areas are different. So this is the, the things that I, will, I, I want to add in the SARA presentation. Thank you, Juana. It's, it's surprising and really interesting to me the geographical differences within the same country, how that can provide diverse population and different diseases to analyze. Uh, that's, that's amazing. And uh, since Julian is based in Argentina, uh, maybe Juli, you can share your experience there. Is there anything you'd like to add or suggest uh, to what Sarah has mentioned? No, about uh, Sara Slice, um, well, yes, and Matt is a, a, a very recognized MOH. Um, since some years ago, they have also like a, a, an MOH web, web page or platform where we can submit all the studies um, online. So it's really fast to make a submission um timelines were also improved in the last time um we have of course some bureaucratic uh, task that we can improve also but the 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 main problem is that we have uh, like a lot of regional moh like it's a, a, not only the egg evaluation for each study or, or for each site uh, but now it's an additional evaluation that it depends where the site is allocated. Uh, each region, each province has a, a local MOH that add a new stage in the startup process that maybe the previous stage before submitting to the MOH is a little bit longer. But then when the when we have all the approvals, the unmat uh, evaluation is 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 not so long. Um, we also have the opportunity, as uh, Juana mentioned, of having a previous meeting with the MOH, uh, but it's only in cases for um, where uh, for studies that has a, a complicated or complex uh, design of the study or where the participant is a vulnerable uh, population. Maybe if the study includes pediatric population, we have some previous stages. Uh, or for example, if uh, we have to use placebo, uh, in pediatric patients, uh, 
it's, it, it depends on the design of, of, of the study. But yes, the, the timelines are, I think are are very good. Good. It's it's great to see improvement there for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lian. Uh Charles, you've been quiet. We want to hear about <laughs> Brazil. <laughs> yes. Uh thank you uh for uh the opportunity again. Uh I would like to say that with my large experience working in Latin America. It's good to see how we've been evolving in some decades in doing clinical trials in the region. So all the countries has been evolving, learning, and increase the quality of the sites. So we need to have a change of mind when thinking about Latin America and not bring bias on how things happen here without knowing exactly what is going on. So we have a very good market for pharma industry. Brazil, Mexico represent uh, a huge market in the area. One thing is very excited for Brazil is recently we approved a law in clinical research. Maybe we're gonna be one of the unique countries who does, uh, who really has a law if not just a regulatory process. This is gonna give us a lot of uh, predictable timelines because this is, is a demand. And this is gonna increase and give more protections and, and uh, to the patients too. So it took almost 10 years to make it happen, but it's now in the process of regulamentation of this law that we're going to be more transparent in compliance, uh, even more than we already have. And we are expecting increase the number of trials a lot in the next years. Just to remember that we have just in Brazil, 900 uh, IRBs uh, already operating. Uh, Anvisa is very connected to FDA and it's going to increase also their process. So we are really excited about this news. Uh, for sure, it's going to need to be regulated. But we, in the last years, we, especially because of COVID-19, we already saw uh, a lot of improvement in the regulatory process, uh, submissions, electronic submissions that we've been doing this for more than 10 years, uh, and the expertise has been increasing a lot. Um, one aspect that I would like to emphasize when they think about uh, Latin America, is not a, a aspects about neglected disease like infectious disease, dengue, malaria, this kind of aspect. Unfortunately, Latin America is, has the experience to have disease from the modern world like uh, obesity, oncology, uh, Alzheimer's disease, the population is becoming older and older. So unfortunately we have this kind of disease and also the neglected disease. So we have uh, opportunities to make this kind of studies uh, in these aspects. And just to finalize, it's very important as Sarah mentioned, when we are looking for sites in Latin America, to really understand the engagement with the PIs, because the PIs are the very important persons in our regulatory process of submissions. Uh, our local health authorities are very interested in the experience and how this uh, key opinion leaders is gonna influence in the future to register these new drugs in the, our countries, considering health economics issues for because we have a socialized medicine. So it's, in a nutshell, this is my initial thought. Thank you, Charles. Uh, music to my ears to hear more transparency and more patients into the studies.
for sure. Um, and since we have already covered the more country specific questions, uh, there's something I kept thinking. Sarah mentioned some key conditions studied in Latin America. Honestly, I was expecting to see diabetes among the list, but also I was pleased to see rare diseases listed there. Um, the ones who know me know that uh, that is that's uh, close to my heart. Uh, so we know how tricky it can be to get funds and patients to study these zebras, as we call them. So I'm wondering, what's the prevalence of rare diseases being studied in Latin America? Um, if I can, uh, we don't have it, it, complete statistics about this, uh, but we imagine just in Brazil that we may have 13 million patients with rare disease. Uh, we are talking about seven to eight. 8,000 rare disease, so it's difficult to identify. But one thing that is very important that most of the countries in Latin America uh, has in the screen uh, inborn uh, tests, newborn screening tests. So it's a demand. Yes. It's, a, it's a demand. It's different than the United States that depend on, of each state, how they implement it. But in Latin America, in the most uh, important countries, is uh, is uh, uh, by law necessary to do this kind of test. So we have a database mm -hmm. of this test for inborn uh, metabolic errors in the region. Brazil is a reference. Uh, we've been working with this more than fifty years in a program that uh, access all the population in Brazil. And I can tell you that uh, we have increasing data about this. That's, that's interesting to know. In Argentina, it's not uh, enforced by law for sure. And those are quite no. expensive tests. But Juli, yes. No, uh, yes, it's not forced by law, but I, in, in my experience uh, working here, um, I see like it's a very uh, huge improvement in 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 receiving studies from uh, of rare disease. Um, uh, some years ago, we don't have so many. The, the, all only the studies are respiratory oncology, and now we have a, a rare a lot of uh, studies from the rare disease that. Maybe I don't know why. Previously, it was not an interesting region to bring in this study, this type of studies. But um, I don't know if because there are less people before. But now uh, there are well talk like rare disease, but they are like new diseases that uh, before uh, uh, we don't study them. But well, um, we really, I, I think we really have a lot of studies from rare disease. Uh, yeah. New, and there are some, last, uh, in the last years, of course. Yeah. And there are some that were considered and, rare a couple of years ago, yes. which are not that rare anymore. This no, and my surprise is, uh, well, in the, in the startup process, uh, here in Worldwide, we, we, we are specialized in in rare disease studies, and we when we do the the startup process and we contact the the PIs, uh, informing that uh, it's going to come uh, an special study for Argentina. Um, they I I I am surprised uh, how happy they are or how surprised or how. Uh, Yes, they want to, oh, there is a study for this in Argentina. And maybe they, they can believe and they are uh, so glad and, and, and grateful sometimes to participate yeah. and, to, and to have the opportunity of being part and of being, of course, the, the principal investigator of this type of studies. But really, in the, in the last time, I'm very surprised how they 
are uh, grateful and happy when when we contact them to to invite to participate in this type of studies. Yeah, that's great. I'm sure they have a lot of families yes. lining up who have been yes. waiting for years for a study yes. for their yes, disease yes, yes. to come local. Yes. Sarah, yes. Yeah, I sorry. mean, this... no, no, go ahead. Hold no, on. no, sorry to add that the, the, here, of course, um, but not of course, but really the, the, the physician, the PIs are very compromised with, with their patients, with the improvement, of course, of, of their health. So I think that that's why they they mm -hmm. they they are grateful or happy when when they receive the notice that they can participate in this type of studies. Yeah. So just to give a little U.S. perspective, you know, one one of the things that the FDA did some years ago, I don't have the exact date in front of me, but they created the orphan drug designation law, and that allowed these rare disease products to come to market more quickly. So that was a big driver to get more rare disease projects out there in the world. And I think one of the challenges that Latin America faces is something that Charles alluded to, and that is getting data. You know, in the United States, we have all these amazing patient advocacy groups, and they, they really are the ones that often push a trial to come into fruition. But that's not necessarily true while it's changing, but that's not necessarily oh. true. Latin America. And so, for example, just one small example, we worked with a client where it was for, I won't get into the disease, but we worked with a rare disease in Mexico and it was like the last 20% of what they needed globally. I mean, that's a huge thing. The, the problem was, or the thing I think we face as rare disease, you know, experts is that you cannot always know where those patients lie. And it's partly a diagnosis problem. Now with better local genetic testing, better yes. network of referring doctors, they're out there. We just have to go find them. So for our people listening, I think people need to realize that they're out there. I mean, it's 10,000 rare diseases. So they're in every country. Um, there is a problem in some Latin American countries where there's a lot of endogamy, which is intermarriage between cousins and all that. And so you do get more rare diseases out of that. So I think diagnosis continues to be our big challenge. We have recently formed an uh, organization that it's part of our company. It's called Rare DM, which means rare diseases in emerging markets to really form more of these referring doctors who see those patients, but they don't know what to do with them. And so it's it's a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity in the region. I just want to put that comment. I, I would like to add something interesting about rare disease in Latin America. As uh, we say that in all Latin America, in the big countries of Latin America, we have uh, medical expertise who already seen some patients and communicating to them with their partners globally. So they see three patients, five patients, or they are very interesting and have publications about their cases. So the question that you mentioned, Sarah, is to connect to these physicians and how to connect these physicians where they are. So this yeah. is the point. Uh, you know, so, sorry. Okay, go ahead. No, no, no. Big... about about your, what you are talking um, here in Argentina, it was like a, a new notice that um, it's like a new application or a web page. Maybe you, Maria, knows it that is called uh, Un Ensayo Para Mi. That is, yes. uh, maybe you know, it's like what, what you are talking, Charles, uh, like uh, um, some, it's a web page where you can like access and you you put the the illness you have the disease uh, what type well the the details and this like contact with a physician that is uh, well, well that has a, that is participating in one of these type of studies uh, well near your near your home uh, well in different type of sites I think it was. Uh, uh, apply also the the this application to another countries from LATAM. I'm not sure if in if Brazil, Colombia, or Mexico. Yes. 
but it's something that is going to to yeah. be exactly. expansive to another countries and it's uh, because it's, a, it's as you mentioned uh, maybe the patients doesn't know that it's an investigational yeah. study where he can participate yeah. they don't know and with this type of of new technologies or or uh, where they, they can connect with the pi with the or with an investigational study that they can participate. Yeah, yes. I want to add, add one comment. Sorry, can I add one comment? Yeah. I think what's still important is connecting with the treating physician and making that connection because that's very cultural for Latin America. And as I said at the beginning of my presentation, I think it's a critical connection because you know, the patient can go off and do their own thing, but especially in rare disease, you need that treating physician to be part of the whole picture. And so it's a great start for sure, but we need to make yeah, sure yes. we're in those referring doctors. I want to add one more comment because this has come up in many projects. Charles and I have worked together on uh, several, and that is what happens when you get the enrollment? Now what? So I think there is another challenge about providing medicine and how long that is, et cetera. And I just want to put that out there, that that continues to be a bit of a challenge in the region. On the other hand, if you say, well, the cost of you know getting three more patients globally or whatever the number is, is really small compared to getting that thing filed with the FDA, for example. So I just want to put that comment out there. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, just one, um, yes, go ahead, I Charles. was uh, uh, the platform that was mentioned exists in all Latin America and also in Brazil, that translated in Portuguese, not just in Spanish. This is okay. a kind of association of patients also is increasing in Latin America for rare disease. Because of this kind of platforms, the patients associations uh, learn that they can act together and make networks without outside patients associations. But one important question is about rare disease. I was in a orphan drugs and rare disease uh, recently to Boston. And besides saying that is a global event, most of the, the presentations were just related to US and Europe. So also the big events has to take an idea. This is a global issue. And Latin America, Asia, Africa, all these areas have has uh, have uh, rare disease. It's not a problem just in USA on mm, Europe. It's a global. So yeah. we are discussing global issue. Indeed, indeed. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. And I, go ahead. Yes, I. I have a question uh, moving into a uh, different topic, actually. But sorry, if you want to add something to this one, please go ahead and I'll go next. No, the only thing I was going to mention is in the United States, patients get paid to be in a trial. Yes. That's not true in any yes. other country I know of. No. No. Ethical like concern or consideration. Just, yes. You know, it could be a whole other topic for us for the webinar. About about this yeah. item, I want to, to highlight that in Argentina, it's a regulation that if the drug, if the medication is positive, is benef uh, has a benefit to, to the patient, uh, there is a compromise from the sponsor to continue providing the medication once the study is uh, has finalized. That's um, important well, that, not to, to, yeah. to uh, if you if the patient has an improvement with the medication and the, and the study is finishing. The sponsor has the, the the commitment and the obligation to to continue providing the drug. This is important in rare disease studies when the when the medication maybe is very has a, a very high cost, like usually. Yeah, you may participate and, in and the, the trial. The, yes, if you participate, you then you have to if 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 the sponsor has patients, then you can continue having the. The, the drug yeah. at no at not cost. Yeah, that's that's, that's very important. Very important, yes. And uh, the, this, the topic uh, I... okay. sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's this, okay. But... This is a very controversial aspects about rare disease and providing long term the the drug. 
because uh, we never know if this works really is going to work at this time in the future, because this is uh, most of this kind of developments are done by small biotechs and medium sized biotechs. So in this law that was approved in Brazil, what we came up with that there is a period of five years after study uh, and more five years uh, after the register the product to be supplied by the sponsor. So in the next five years of the register of the drug, the government has to have time to implement this cost by the government because it's a socialized medicine. So in this way, we can protect the, the, the company to know what's gonna happen and also the obligation, the government to be responsible for this kind of treatment. So this is what we came up with our law here in Brazil. Thank you, Charles. And I have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, I will start okay. with one that is of interest also for me. And I probably know the answer to this one, but I guess it may be of, uh, interesting for the audience since they are asking. Um, they would like to know if there are any specific language requirements for documentation in different Latin American countries. Um, I can speak about this for hours, but I'll let you all to it. Maybe Juana, you'd like to no. to share your thoughts on this one? Yes. Yes, I, I think it's important to have a clear language in the in the sensitive documents, such as a, in a informed consent form, because maybe the same word for different uh, countries in Latam uh, is or have different meaning. So Maybe if I use one word in Colombia, maybe in Mexico, Argentina, or other countries with uh, Spanish speaking, they say, what are you saying? <laughs> or what is the meaning of this phrase? So it's important to have a specific translation it, it, from my point of view, of course, um, for sensitive uh, material for patient. I, I think all facing uh, patient material must be translated in the Spanish uh, for the for the country. I, I have a, a, a it's a it's a experience, recent experience because uh, for Portuguese uh, uh, I received a, a title of the of the protocol and I said I'm I'm not expert in Portuguese. I'm going to send to the Brazilian team. And the people said, no, this word in Portugal is okay. But for us, it's something uh, wrong. Is 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 not fine for our uh, spoken language. So please correct this word. So I think yes, the language is very sensitive and it's it's high uh, importance to use the correct language in each country. Thank you. And we have another question from the audience, and this one is related to AI. Um, there's one of our attendees who would like to use to know if the use of AI in clinical trials is regulated in Latin American countries. This is interesting. Um, I may job. say that I may say that e-consent is moving on in this kind of aspect. But AI, it's a broad concept. What kind of AI in, in that analysis, uh, trying to find patients, uh, things that we need to more, be more specific. But we have to understand that all Latin America has a law for data protection. So uh, anonymized data, it can be used, uh, in this kind of aspect, but there are many discussions. I don't think this is just in Latin America, but global, how are we gonna use? But you can say now that AI is being used in, in, in Brazil for developing new drugs. 
So we need to specify more aspects. Uh, this and also AI, maybe for the reason of the question, is being using a lot for uh, aspects of uh, the documents for contracts. Uh, this kind of aspect is for sure is being using uh, and making some uh, revision of of uh, previous uh, publications. So we need to have more specific regarding this aspect. Yeah, I just want to jump in here, Maria, and say that it's here, AI is here, there's no you know, doubt. That. But I think there's a danger that we have to be very careful with it. I was in a call recently with a bunch of CROs about what's going on in the region, and one company is doing something very interesting that can be applied globally, and that is, and we've done it more manually, but back to my referring physician story, if you can provide through AI, like easy ways to say, okay, yeah, this patient could qualify, that's gonna be a great tool. The other tool that's already out there is using um, your phone just to say, get this patient you know, in their, in their visits, et cetera. So I think there's a place for it, but to Charles' point, we have to be very careful about the data that we're collecting and how it's being collected. And I think all countries are gonna be stricter, even the United States about this whole process. So it's there, there's a place for it, but we still need a gateway and that's usually the doctor. I, yeah, it, it, it's here. Yes, Juana. Yeah, just to, to answer the, the, the question, at least in Colombia, the uh, artificial intelligence is not regulated so far. But uh, if you can see the history of the process to approve some legislation, the first part is the common practice. And you see uh, maybe an ethical uh, consequences to the the good use or bad use of a tool. I mean, if you have a chair, you can use to sit on the chair or use to hit somebody. See, so in this case, the uh, artificial intelligence is another tool that you can use to recollect information to make easier a meta analysis in 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 past time that we can manually or we can use for other point of view <laughs> so the 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 um i think the regulation by law maybe is necessary in the next future but in the first step is an ethical analysis and bioethics analysis, because the ethical analysis will provide to us an analysis if we can do it or we can't. But if we are going to use a bioethical analysis, maybe we will have a, a overview about the science, the engineers uh, by uh, research, and we have a, a an overview of the use of this tool. And maybe based on this bigger analysis, we can start to work in the local regulation. Thank you, Juana. Thank you very much for sharing your insight for Colombia. Julian, do we have any uh, insights from Argentina? No, I think- uh, It's not regulated, right? Yes, no, this is not regulated in Argentina, but I think uh, in my experience, first of uh, the first uh, step it will be like using it uh, inside the company you know to to improve process how uh, no, i don't know uh, prepare documents uh, regulatory package consent form i think the the, the first uh, step to to know and to learn about how we can use it it will be internally uh, for the companies. Thank you very much for that input, Huli. Um, so I have another question. Um, and in, in being conscious of the time, we are only five minutes away. 
uh, from top of the hour. Uh, I wanted to, to share that the work we do here at Vistatech often advances diversity by means of language and culture. So my question is, do regulatory frameworks in Latin America enhance diversity in clinical trials? We have some very fresh baked news from yesterday uh, in, in relation to this topic. Or So I wanted to know what do CROs and sponsors do to ensure representation of maybe less represented populations? I mean, I'd like to just comment. We were talking earlier about this. You know, the FDA is focused on phase three trials. I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? These are the late phase trials. And the question is here that we all have to answer, can we get the diversity that the FDA wants, which is numbers, by utilizing in clinical trials and, and enrolling patients in Latin America? I think that's the big question that's not clear in that document. I think the answer is yes, because at the end of the day, the FDA just wants numbers. At the same time, obviously in the United States, we want to work towards better diversity in US patients. But we also know that that's not so easy. So that's just a general comment. I'll open it up to our colleagues. Of course. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, how about the rest? Uh, I think uh, regarding some aspects uh, about bioethics, equity of population is very important. Uh, so if we are dealing with clinical trials, the opportunities is for everyone. So it depends of ethnicity or rich, poor, whatever. So first we need to uh, provide tools that everybody can participate in a clinical trials in our region and provide this kind of opportunities for uh, everyone. And, and for sure, our governments in socialized medicine are very concerned about the costs of innovation and new medications, especially for rare disease. And this involves diversity, especially diversity. So uh, this is the main point. Uh, we in Latin America, we don't live uh, without, uh, with so much clusters as in USA, in developing yeah. countries, the most aspects is social disparity. So that's why I'm talking about justice, equity, and possibility to participate in clinical trials. So I think yes. for us, the concern is give the chance of the population to participate and have access to new treatments. This is our yes. main concern. Yeah. I agree with, 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 with Charles because here in Argentina also, well, maybe we don't have very ethnical uh, diversity. The most diversity is social. And as, as I, I was mentioning Maria yesterday, I think that the, the, the good notice or the, the, the best of these studies is that uh, in the same study, well, they have, we have all type of patients, but uh, the, the importance to have maybe the best site from Argentina, the most expensive, but also we can have another PI that works in a public hospital. So maybe the, 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 the patient that has a, a lot of money can access to the best hospital, but also there is the free treatment for a patient that yeah. has a vulnerable, a vulnerable position, social, economic, whatever. They, they both can have the same access to the same study, maybe in different yeah. sites, but the important is that they can participate both in the yeah. in, in all type of sites the most That's... technology the most big and the public hospital the importance of the CRO of the sponsor is to have diversity when we select the PIs yes thank you Juli sorry we are out of time so um once everyone has the opportunity to read and digest this new guidance me included it's 
over 26 pages, so I, I made it some time to look into this uh, in detail. We'll be sure to gather a group of experts to discuss this uh, guidance's consequences. So watch this space and stay tuned to our next episode of Life, Sci Life Sciences In Focus webinar. I know we can talk about this for hours, but we are past the time. Uh, so a big thank you to Sarah, Charles, Juana and Julian for joining us today and share all this insight. It's been amazing to share this panel with you. And also a big thank you to our audience for attending today's webinar. We appreciate your input. So probably you will receive a survey afterwards. And if you have any doubts about your localization programs, uh, please feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to help. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you.